I'm what are we doing? <laughs> we're going to do sustaining. Out. Okay, we ready for it? Let's go. Is Michael ready? I'm good. I would say All I'm right. just uh, shutting my phone on silent. All right. All right. Here we go. Nice. Three, two. Welcome to the Ephesiology Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the study of the early Christian movement and its implications for the church today. We are with Michael, our resident Ephesiologist, Andrew Johnson, Associate Pastor at Neartown Church in Houston, Texas. And I'm Matt Till, Pastor of Restoration Church in the Chicagoland suburbs. Good to be with you guys again on another edition and another week of the Ephesiology Podcast. How's everyone doing? I actually am good. <laughs> As they talk over each other. That's awesome. Andrew, we heard that you're doing good. Michael? You know, uh, um, yeah, I'm doing well. Doing well. Hey, uh, little, you know, there's a, I think the, there's a sense of the, for the three of us that we're a bit giddy uh, <laughs> for some reasons. But Well, the, because I think by the time this podcast uh, airs, uh, the book, uh, would it be out? Oh, no, it's, uh, no, yeah, it's coming. No, it's this 29th. week. Yeah, the 29th, yeah. February 29th. It's coming out the book officially. If you haven't pre-ordered it yet, pre-order it. You can do that on physiology.com, find it on Amazon, um and all your places where your favorite books are sold. Yeah. So yeah, that, I mean there's almost a sense of relief that finally we've made it and uh excited about it and excited about and praying about the contribution that it'll Lord willing make. So. Yeah, I think it's going to be great. And I think uh, we're already getting a little bit, uh, it's just some buzz and some people are really excited about it coming out and ready to read it and d- dig into it furthermore. So um, we're just really excited that it's it's finally here. So thanks to William Carey Publishers as well for their work on the book. Yeah. So uh, this week, guys, we're going to be talking about um, kind of continuing off of uh, from two weeks ago, two episodes ago, uh, we talked about the anatomy of a movement and kind of really a natural bridge from the anatomy of a movement goes into what does it, call, what does it look like for us to sustain a movement. So we looked at the just the kind of the building blocks and the foundations to what creates or the, as we break apart what a movement looks like as we see it through scripture in the first century church. But now we're going to start talking about really what does it look like for us to sustain a movement? And what does even scripture say about sustaining a movement? So, Michael, why don't you just kind of kick us off there? Where do we look for movements beyond the, you know, we we look at Acts, we look at Ephesians, we look at, um, you know, Galatians, we look at Paul's letters, and now we go, okay, so here's the building blocks. This is like on the ground. These are the pieces that are coming together for this new Christian movement that's occurring. But where do we go for advice or for in, uh, for beyond, you know, just those immediate years after the ascension of Christ? Yeah, yeah, that's and that's what we're trying to do with sustaining a movement. You know, when I was early on in my church planting efforts um, in Eastern Europe, one of the things that I learned was that, and I did this even in my studies, I, I was an architecture major, um, and uh, we would always envision what the end product would look like. And then, then we would take the steps, make the steps to get to the to that end product. And and uh, in church planting, we, we do the same thing. We, we know what it is that we want to get to, and now let's let's what's the path forward to get there? Mm. And then, to some extent, Scripture has beautifully given us that picture of what the goal is, and uh, and then uh, we have instructions on how to get there. Uh, to that goal. So it's not talking about methods of getting there, but it's giving us a description of what it looks like th- through that process of, of getting to the goal. And then the, through our, our uh, if you will, uh, ingenuity, influenced, of course, by being empowered by the Holy Spirit, we begin to think about, well, how does this make sense in our context? And what we see in that movement in Ephesus is it culminates uh, in in the New Testament, in the book of Revelation. And, uh, and so it, Revelation paints this picture of what the completion of the mission looks like. And what more, uh, until that completion occurs, does the church need to do to ensure and s- to sustain uh, the health of the movement? And so I, um, I yeah. If I, I could just I, jump I mean, in, only this... Yeah, yeah I, and I was just going to say, so what then is for us, as we're talking about Revelation giving us this 
Um, th- what we called it when I did church planting training school uh, through Antioch's material, Antioch and Waco. Um, we call it Z thinking, you know, begin with the end in mind, exactly what you're saying. Uh, if, if Revelation is the Z, what is the direct connection then to Ephesians? Yeah, well, of course, uh, the, the book of Revelation is written to the seven churches of Asia Minor. And the first letter that actually Jesus writes to those churches is to the church in Ephesus. And, uh, and so there's the connecting point here. Now, first, let's take just a step back and think about, well, how do we approach uh, the, the book of Revelation? Because it's, it's I can remember uh, after I came to Christ, um, I, th- I think my, the first letter I wrote, uh, I wrote the first book I read uh, in the Bible was the Gospel of John. The second one, and the guy who led me to Christ loves the, or he has shared this story before, uh, it reminds me that I came enthusiastically saying that now that I've read the gospel of John, I'm going to read the book of revolution. <laughs> Sounds about right. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know what, in some ways it is a book of, of, uh, revolution, but not in, yeah. the, in the same sense that we think of it. But typically, I mean, we learn in our seminary studies and through any number of books on the letter, uh, or on the book of Revelation, that the book of Revelation is an apocalyptic work, um, and it is about the end times, what theologians call eschatology. And so we look there at uh, signs for what is going to happen when the end comes. And uh, and we become we have become historically, it seems like to me, especially in the United States and maybe around the world, uh, that just consumed with the, the end times and uh, trying to predict the things that are going to happen and trying to fit current uh, circumstances, uh, geopolitical, economic, uh, social circumstances into the book of Revelation in order to have some sense of when the end is going to come. It's almost like Mad Libs. Like every, there's like a blank space and it's like, is this the geopolitical leader? that I can mad lib into this part of revelation. Is this the country that this uh, directly ties to? Right. Right. I mean, you can go down a list of names of people that have uh, been accused of being the antichrist. They're probably top of the list uh, is the Pope. Uh, I don't know how many times over the, the 30 years of my Christian life that I've heard that the Pope is the antichrist and, Others have, in more recent times, have talked about Obama being the Antichrist. And, and, and um, I, I mean, I get that. I get the idea that we want to know the future. And the book of Revelation has the answer. In fact, John says that, that whoever reads this book is going to be blessed. And so the, the idea that has emerged from that is that, wow, if we read this book, we're going to understand the end times and what's going to happen. And um, and the events that are occurring in in society uh, today, and I'm not so certain that that was the purpose. In fact, um, I would say that when we focus so much attention on the eschatological aspects of that piece of apocalyptic literature, we miss the the um, What's the saying? We miss the trees for the forest, or we miss yeah. them, right? Yeah, forest through the trees. The forest through the trees. Yeah. Before, or, well, something we yeah. miss something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you know, and and yeah, Michael, what I was gonna say is, and I think what's helpful too when we approach Revelation is that, and I think where the emphasis is for us in this conversation today about sustaining a movement is that the letters to the churches that stand out in the first, uh, you know. Well, chapters two and three, right? Um, these letters stand out really from the rest of the book of Revelation. And we've always known that. These are, have always been pieces that we've always looked at. And so these are some very distinct letters. They are very, they are uh, prophetic words uh, given, um, you know, through Jesus Christ to John for these particular churches that were real, that they were actual real bodies of believers that were gathering in real communities and real cities that were being, that had turned to Christ 
to be the church, right? right? And so these are something very distinct, and these are very important words to these real churches. These are not hypothetical churches in the future. We don't replace the names with Rome or you know or or the United States of America or Israel. Like you know, we're not that. That's not what's what? happening in these in these chapters. But rather, they are very distinct, and they are two real churches in its place and in its time in that first century. Yeah, so I exactly. think that's where we're trying to go today, right? Right, exactly. Yeah, I, I don't look at the seven churches as as uh, indicating seven uh, dispensations that we need to go through until uh, before the end times go. I, I don't look at the letters necessarily as, the, you know, indicating where we are at, um, in in relationship to the end times. But uh, but you're yeah you're exactly right. Uh, they they are letters of instruction, and to some extent, yes, they are prophetic because Jesus warns; he gives warnings uh, to mm-hmm. these churches. But they're also uh, letters of encouragement. I mean, the things that Jesus says about a couple of the churches. I mean, you just think, wow, that is cool that that was going on. Um, and and especially to the letter to the church in Ephesus. Now, let me take just one step back here because I think this is important um, for us to to begin to wrestle with. And something that was striking to me as I was not only studying Revelation but just looking at you know the things that Jesus said uh, in his ministry. And there are a couple instances when. When, of course, the disciples are curious about when is the end going to come and when's the kingdom going to be established. And, of course, the last time that they said this was uh, just before Jesus' ascension back to his throne. And they're gathered together in Acts chapter 1, and the disciples want to know when is the kingdom uh, coming. And Jesus says to them what he consistently said, that it is not for us to know. That's for the Father to know. But you are to remain here until you are empowered with the Holy Spirit, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the world. And so Jesus always points the disciples back to the mission. Um, He's not concerned about the future. That's something the Father is concerned about. Jesus wants the disciples to focus on the mission that's at hand. And that they would be, as I say repeatedly in the book, myopically focused on this mission, that this is what it's about. And so as I come to the, to the final book in the New Testament, uh, Revelation, I have to ask myself the question, did anything change? Has anything changed since the disciples were commissioned to be on that mission to lead us to believe that now is the, it's okay for us to focus on the end times and trying to figure this out. And the answer that I arrive at is, well, no, nothing's changed. In fact, what I'd suggest is that our uh, propensity to be distracted by things of the end times has taken us away from the mission. And, um, and, and has caused us to lose what Jesus tells the, the uh, church in Ephesus to abandon our first love. Mm-hmm. And that first love, as I uh, argue in the book, is to be on God's mission. And if we look at the book of Revelation, we see that. And I think the, the key to interpret that letter is in chapter 10, verse 11. After John receives the scroll from the angel, he eats it and it's sweet to his taste and bitter to his stomach. And then the angel says to John, you must continue to prophesy about the nations, the peoples, the languages, and the kings, referring to the fact that there is coming a day that God's mission will be complete and that every nation, every king, every language, every tribe it will bow before the throne of God in worship of him. Now, that's not painting a universalist picture. That's painting the picture that God will be worshiped by a representation of every ethnic group, every tribe, every language, every people. Yeah. And that's a theme that he repeats throughout that book in Revelation 5, 9, in, um, <clears throat> in 7, 9, in 10, 11, in 14, 6, and 15, 4, all throughout 
uh, that is the big picture of Revelation, that these events are going to happen. But uh, John is to remind those seven churches, do not lose sight of this mission. This is your task. Yes, there'll be seven bowls of wrath. There'll be seven trumpets. There'll be four uh, uh, horsemen and all these other things are going to happen. But do not lose sight of this mission that you are on. And that and that's why Jesus writes the, the letter to the churches uh, of Asia Minor. I think it's helpful too, just to uh, like, again, like putting this in its historical context. I mean, this is written, I mean, at, at the time near the end of what I, I don't, you know, get my dating completely right, but this would be probably one of the last letters or last books written in the New Testament. Right. And so you literally have kind of almost this final word from Jesus to these churches that have already been, now been started. They've been ignited. They're multiplying. They're growing. They're seeing new converts. They're, they're like suffering. The, Suffering, yes, thank you, Absolutely. persecution. But even when we go back to the anatomy of the movement, what we talked about in that uh, podcast two episodes ago is like these things were taking place. And now here's the final thrust. Here's how this sustains. Here's how we see this and usher God's will uh, of glorifying him uh, amongst all people everywhere. This is how you sustain this until the end of time, right? Yeah, absolutely. Here's the I, I think so. I, I think so. And here's the interesting thing, you know, and, and I'm, I'm not saying this, this is right or wrong, but um, for some reason, uh, we don't give a lot of attention to what Jesus tells these churches. And uh, nor do we, nor do we uh, mm-hmm. look at these as things that need to characterize us as a church. And instead, we, you know, we'll talk about the nine marks of a healthy church or, or you know, we'll come up with any list of things that should mm-hmm. characterize us. And, and it's not that those are wrong. Uh, they're, they're right. I mean, there are things that show us that our churches are healthy. But leading that list, I would suggest, is, uh, is what we see in Jesus. Jesus himself, the builder of the church, is giving us a list of things that should characterize us above any, I would think, above any other list. I mean, this is really remarkable. Remember, Jesus only uses the word church two times in the Gospel of Matthew. One, of course, when he uh, is talking about the church's authority, uh, and but the first time he uses it is uh, when he refers to Peter. And, uh, and the proclamation that Jesus is the Christ, and it's upon this rock that he will build his church. And, uh, and then, it, you know, we get to the book of Revelation, and here Jesus, Jesus writes seven letters to seven churches, Matt, as you hmm. just uh, described, that these were significant movements uh, of empowered, Holy Spirit-empowered believers in Asia Minor. And uh, God was doing a remarkable thing, and he does not want them to lose sight of yeah. this mission. Yeah. And so what you kind of want to say then is, as you said, this, this kind of goes back again to identity. These are character things that Jesus says, this is what I see in you. This is what I want in you. But this is not something so quickly that we should uh, make into like a BuzzFeed listicle. Like, here are your seven points. And as long as these things are good, Jesus goes thumb up, you know, we're all, we're all fine here. Move on that. These are something worth focus. This is something worth meditation. These are some things that we should say should be first and foremost in our pursuit of God's mission in the world. Right. Yeah, yeah. Ab- absolutely. Mm, absolutely. It's good. Well, let's get onto this list of sustaining a movement then. Um, and as we, and, and Michael, as we kind of look at this, these are all coming out of the seven letters to the seven churches, right? Here right. in Revelation. Yeah. So the first one on sustaining a movement, what does it take to sustain a movement? These are the words of Jesus coming to us. One obeys the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And so to every church that Jesus ends his letter, with that command to the one who obeys uh, the Holy Spirit. And so that's clear that we are to be churches, uh, a, a, a people uh, coming together who have been called out, who are obeying the Holy Spirit. And implicit in that is the idea that we're, we're empowered by the Holy Spirit, that we listen to him, 
to lead us, to guide us on God's mission. Again, everything has to point to his mission because that's uh, w- what I'm suggesting is the purpose of the book of Revelation is to show us that we are to be on this mission that God is that God is on and we are privileged to join. And so the obedience to the Holy Spirit is this obedience to be on a, a mission uh, with him. So can I, can I jump in? And maybe this is uh, touching on some of the pneumatology stuff that we say is seen and understood in the book of Ephesians. Sure. But what does so, it mean to but, like but, obey but, the Holy Spirit? Yeah, but first you have to explain that big word. Pneumatology, study of the Holy Spirit, uh, pneuma. Uh, wind or spirit in Greek. Um, so if, if, thank you, uh, what does it then mean? Because um, there are probably a whole lot of people listening that have seen what obeying the Holy Spirit looks like in an uh, uncontained sort of way where um, there's a lot of bad history. Uh, with some of uh, what people have seen in a Pentecostal movement that's uncontained. And so someone would read obeys the Holy Spirit and they think, oh, okay, so this is always constantly changing. I just have to sit and listen to the Holy Spirit. And if the Holy Spirit tells me to go and do something crazy, then that's, that's the Holy Spirit speaking. There are other people who are far more reserved and say the Holy Spirit is not actively speaking. He has already spoken through his word, and that's all we need. So, Michael, our resident ephesiologist, I now put it to you to answer all of the theological questions that everybody listening has. Thank you so much for answering this. <laughs> yeah, right. Man, you know what? That takes a whole podcast just to address well, those things. But, um, I mean, what I would say to this is that, of course, the Holy Spirit is is not a uh, foreign to the New Testament authors. Paul brilliantly uh, helps us to understand who he is in Ephesians chapter one, and um, and calls us to uh, allow the Holy Spirit to give us a spirit of wisdom and in revelation, so that we understand these things. He is the one, as Paul says, that seals us. Uh, that guarantees the inheritance that we have as adopted children who are on God's mission. Um, And so the Holy Spirit is always connected to God's mission uh, in in the world. In fact, again, recall Acts chapter one, you will receive power and you will be witnesses when the Holy Mm -hmm. Spirit comes upon you. Mm -hmm. And so what we see all throughout the book of Acts then is uh, what many have rightly called the acts of the Holy Spirit. That's right. Um, and, uh, and we see him at work. And what he does, and this is, we can't miss this point, what he does results in people coming to Christ, more and more people worshiping him, because that's who he is. That's who Jesus in uh, John's gospel tells us who he is. So he is always going to bear witness to Christ. And so when we see these incredible things happen, uh, throughout the book of Acts, I mean, we uh, the Holy Spirit comes on the disciples. They they speak in tongues, or uh, or those who are in Jerusalem hear their language. And so we, I mean, the there's foreign languages. Yeah, yeah, there are um, different ways in which people have understood this. Either right. the disciples actually were speaking in foreign languages, or th- those who changed the it. auditory. Yeah, the receiving. Yeah. So whatever happened, the result was that 3,000 people, uh, men and women, came to Christ. And and so if if we look then throughout the whole uh, of the book of Acts, every time we see a miraculous event occur, that by the act of the Holy Spirit, the result is that people come to Christ. Mm -hmm. And that's so important for us to understand if we're going to properly understand pneumatology. The Holy Spirit acts people come to Christ. And we're seeing this around the world. I mean, these miraculous things that uh, are being reported and and things that uh, we observe result in people coming to Christ. Um, You know, he's, he's, the Holy Spirit is not acting willy nilly. Uh, There is his role to bring glory to Christ, to draw people to Christ. And he does that. 
And uh, as he does that, then we're sanctified because of him. He works in our lives and he continues to empower us to be on God's mission. And so Jesus doesn't want the churches to lose sight of this as he's mm-hmm. writing the letters. So the first in uh, what it looks like for us to, to sustain a movement we see here from Revelation is obeys the Holy Spirit. Number two is confronts false teaching. Yeah, th- so what we're uh, seeing here, and this is it's specifically focused on the church in Ephesus, and Jesus says to the church that, you know, I've seen that you don't stand for uh, th- those false teachers who are calling themselves apostles. And the, the church confronted that false teaching. And, uh, and I mean, that is a critical part for us, uh, in, even in the church today. You know, there are all kinds of false teachings. And you know, we, we've been interacting on uh, a survey that was done in 2018 by uh, Lee Guineer in partnership with Lifeway Research on the state of theology in American uh, evangelicalism in, in, mm-hmm. in America in general, but specifically looking at American evangelicalism. And what we're seeing from the, uh, the results of that survey uh, is that nearly 71% of American evangelicals believe that Jesus is a created being. And 59% uh, believe that the Holy Spirit is a personal force rather than a personal being. And these are not Christian ideas. These are not, they're not biblical. They're not biblical ideas. Um, and that also goes back to our, our, just the anatomy of, of a movement, which is uh, one of the key elements is correct teaching or what we said last time, authoritative doctrine. Yeah. And that is, are we, are we truly teaching the proper doctrine? Are we teaching the correct, are we having the correct teaching? And then the ongoing of the sustaining is not only do we maintain the correct teaching, but we must confront the false teaching. Right, right. Yeah, Can, and, so, and something's happening, it seems like, in at least in the American evangelical church. And I mean, this is happening in other churches. And I, I share a mm-hmm. story about an incident in South Asia where this was happening. And, um, and when, but we have to properly address these things. And that's so important for the church to be sustained. Can I jump in and say it's necessary, but what happens if then the reaction looks like all you do as a church is chase what you believe to be false teaching? If you exist to basically shoot down everything that you think is out of line Mm -hmm. and you've essentially made your existence as a teacher or as a church, Church, somebody that is going to quote hold firm to doctrine, and um, that's later. I understand, but um, what what happens when that becomes your passion project, and then that forces you almost to drift, you know, to lose sight of the mission? Right. Yeah, and that's. I mean, those are the, one of the challenges is trying to answer the question. Well, what is uh, correct teaching? And uh, how do we determine that? And and I, I think we can determine that. And um, and one of the ways in which we do that is that we have to distinguish between um, what is authoritative and then what is opinion or what, what uh, the early church fathers would call theologomena. And I explained this more in the book. We but, also talked a lot about that in the last podcast as well on this topic is addressing what does that look like to figure out what, what is that authoritative or what is the correct doctrine teaching. Right, right, right. Yeah, and where we see doctrines really going askew is more along the lines of understanding who Jesus is. And, um, and so that's key. I mean, we have got to mm-hmm. do a better job of talking about who Jesus is. Our Christology needs to be first and foremost. It, it needs, yeah. And, we, and uh, so who is he ontologically in his very being? And who is he in his function? Um, and, uh, and, and how do we effectively communicate who he is and what what the data at least seems to be indicating in the United States is that we're not doing very well in communicating with Jesus. <laughs> right if 71% of evangelicals um, th- 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 believe that Jesus is created boy something is happening in how we are teaching about him that is not connecting with people that are uh, coming to church 
Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's interesting in, um, Andrew, as you were kind of asking your question, I was, uh, something I hear often is, you know, we want to be known more about what we're for, not what we're against. Um, that seems to be some phraseology that's used a lot in, in kind of our churches. It's in reaction. It. It, it, it's, yeah. And it's in reaction to, um, I think the constant, let's be against all of these other things and people and teaching and rather let's try to prop up what we're for. Um, and I think that's a, that's helpful construct for us, but you know, even as I'm thinking about it and looking at this is a direct letter from Jesus to the church of Ephesus, to the church in, in Ephesus. And he's referring to their church. He's referring to the, the community of followers of believers here in Ephesus. And it's like, you're confronting the false teaching that exists within your body, within the church itself. Um, you're not pointing, you're not, you're not calling out to, you know, uh, Sardis in Philadelphia. And, you know, you're not, you're not lobbing bombs on the internet about, you know, uh, <laughs> the other doctrines. Now I granted, um, obviously we didn't, they didn't have the technological advancements that we have today. We're far more interconnected. And so when we look at the church, we look at ourselves oftentimes as a global church and a global movement of people. So it complicates that more. But clearly, though, there's a sense of like, if there's false teaching within your midst, it needs to be addressed. You don't, we don't need to be concerned about the false teaching of the others around us, but let us be concerned about the own, our own body, our own, our own sense of those, because we want to be about, about God's movement. And if we're not confronting false teaching within our own selves, then we're not going to see the movement move forward, even within our own context. My friend, Seth Trout really says this well. He talks about when looking at the teachings of Jesus, um, everybody who loves the lovey-dovey Jesus, and they kind of want to encapsulate him. Seth always just says, look at what Jesus says. So when he comes out and says something as fact, what he does is he presents something, but he is presenting it in polls. So what he says is this is true, which necessarily means this other thing is not true. And when he says, come to me, he's also saying, don't go anywhere else because you will not be satisfied. You will not find life. Uh, go through all of the teachings of Jesus right now to kind of prove this point. Yeah. But when we as teachers to mm -hmm. confront false teaching, we are going to say, this is who Jesus is. Mm -hmm. This is who he is in function and ontologically, which means... This other thing is not true. You cannot hold both of these things to be true at once. For one thing to be true means the other is not true, which means we are confronting these false things by showing this one thing is true. Yeah. Well, we got to keep moving because we've got a long list. <laughs> we've got a few more <laughs> points in this list. So let's keep going through it. But that was good. And I, this is a good dialogue for us to be thinking about. All right. So what it looks like for us to sustain a movement Obeying the Holy Spirit is one. Number two, confronting false teaching. Number three, proclaims God's glory. Yeah, again, and this goes to the purpose of the letter, uh, the book of Revelation, that this is about the completion of God's mission. And Jesus is calling the church in Ephesus back to uh, the, their first love. Uh, they had abandoned the works of their first love. And Jesus is saying, you know what, guys, get back to it. And as we've been saying all throughout this podcast, that first love is this myopic passion to be on God's mission of uniting all things in Christ. And what a joy it is for us to be a part of that. Um, and uh, this was the church in Ephesus. I mean, that was flat out the characteristic of that church, mm. that it, it focused on uh, that mission and it carried it out faithfully. Mm -hmm. uh, to such an extent as, as again, we've been saying over and over again uh, in, in the book of Acts, in two places, Acts 19.10 and Acts 19.20, uh, Luke tells us that the word of the Lord spread throughout all of Asia, uh, that every resident heard, and there was just this fantastic movement uh, that occurred at, as a result. And so the proclamation of God's glory uh, has to continue to be the passion that uh, drives us and motivates us to uh, join with him to see more people worship him. Mm. So evangelism still matters. Absolutely. It still matters. Absolutely. Obeys the Holy spirit confronts false teaching proclaims God's glory. How about number four on our list of sustaining a movement stands up 
for the marginalized. Stands up for the marginalized. And now this is interesting here because uh, these three things are specific to the church in Ephesus. Confront false teaching. And it's not that others aren't told to do that. but It's just mentioned in the specific letter. Yeah. And so this is what I find fascinating about the church in Ephesus. So Jesus is writing this letter and he says to them, I'm commending you because you stand up against false teaching. And then uh, he he says, "Don't you know? Get back to what you've abandoned. You've abandoned your first love." And then then he says again, "I'm commending you because you are standing up for the marginalized." And and how he puts it is that he he says that that you do not stand for the work of the Nicolaitans. And now this is interesting and it's complex. And again, I go into a bit more detail in the book. But the Nicolaitans was believed to be a group that could have been, and I'm <laughs> preferencing all of these things with uh, the could have and might have been because we don't know for certain. But Irenaeus, uh, the, the, who writes in the late uh, second century, tells us about uh, a group that were known as the Nicolaitans. And they were believed to have been a group that was started by Nicholas, one of the seven that were chosen to, uh, you know, serve the tables in Acts chapter six. Um, and, and what he describes is that Nicholas came to the point to, to, uh, believe that abstinence was critical in our spiritual lives and we were not to have sexual relations, but at the same time, for him, uh, he would he would allow his wife to be abused sexually by others. Now, again, we don't know um, if this is the right story or not. Irenaeus just simply relates it, and others picked up on it as well. And so, John. Uh, it, is identifying something that's going on in Ephesus with this sexual immorality. And that fits with what we know about uh, the position of women in the city of Ephesus. Uh, there are many ancient sources that talk about uh, these, uh, uh, a specific group of women that were nor known as uh, courtesans. And these courtesans would uh, entertain male guests, and uh, they would enter into uh, intellectual conversations with them while, in some instances, at the same time, uh, performing sexual favors um, or entertaining these men in a sexual way. And so there are fascinating early letters um, or early documents, ancient documents, that are writing about these women. And, and one document talks about one particular woman who was more intellectually engaging. Can you imagine this? More intellectually engaging than Socrates or hmm. otherwise known as Socrates. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so she would entertain these men and others would join her in entertaining these men. And there would be, you know, these sexually immoral acts that would go on. And so what's, what, uh, Jesus is saying to the church in Ephesus, he's commending them. You've stood against this. You're not tolerating the marginalization of women, the exploitation mm. of women. And you have stood up uh, against this. And so a part, it seems to me, a part of sustaining uh, the church is that we need to be involved, not only in good apologetics ministry that's confronting uh, uh, false teaching, but in good social justice ministry that is standing up for the marginalized. Mm. And at the same time, keeping that in balance with not losing our first love, and that's mm -hmm. being on God's mission to proclaim his glory mm -hmm. to all the nations. So another, the other week when we were on the podcast with Alan Hirsch, um, one of the things that brought up was, was saying, we, we've discussed this, and I know it's also in the book, but w we talked about saying, is, is your church having the impact, socioeconomic impact in your area to show that like the gospel is real and it is live and it is is going forth to not ask the question how many more conversions or how many new butts and seats do you have for your gatherings but you know did the suicide rate go down in your area mm. um were more widows and orphans cared for 
And, and I think what's critical about this is when we're saying stands up for the marginalized, we are not picking this up and then dropping gospel proclamation that standing up for the marginalized is part two of proclamation. You have proclaimed the good news. You have proclaimed God's glory. And because you have done that, now you stand up for the marginalized. Uh, it is not sacrificing one for the other. They're held in tandem, but one is the result. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one is a, an identification of our love for God. It's a mark of our love for God. We will be proclaiming God's glory it, and we will be confronting false teaching and we will be standing up for the marginalized. All three of those things go together. Um, mm. it, one's not sacrificed for the other. And, and this is, I mean, this, I think this is important for us in the church uh, today that sometimes, you know, we'll, we'll see that there will be those that focus solely on an apologetics ministry. Um, they want to confront the false teaching of uh, new religious movements, for example, or there'll be those that just want to focus on social justice issues and be concerned about, you know, the plight of those uh, who are trafficked uh, in the in the United States and around the world, or uh, focusing on other social ills in in uh, our country, uh, and then there'll there'll be those who say, you know what, it's hard on to sharing the the gospel uh, with everybody. We need to proclaim the gospel. But what Jesus is showing us here, what he is writing to the letter in the church, uh, to the church in Ephesus, is that all of this is a part of what it means to be the body of Christ. It, we're, it, we're to be about all of this, not any single one. Um, and again, rem reminding the church over and over again, all throughout the rest of the book of Revelation, that we are on God's mission to see his name proclaimed all around the world to every nation, tribe, and, and people. Mm. Yeah, that's good. That's good. And even just thinking uh, back to Ephesians 5, even 5.11, um, Paul writes, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead oppose them. And just again, just kind of that reiteration of the calling out of whatever, whoever the, uh, you know, Nicolaitans were um, and whatever it is that they were participating in, it seems clear that they were continuing in their call that they were originally given. And that is, do not participate in the works of darkness, but rather expose them. And so standing up for the marginalized is part of exposing those who are being marginalized. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I mean, that's, I think, part of the brilliance of the movement in Ephesus was there was such an emphasis on standing up for the marginalized. I mean, Paul gets to that in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, that very difficult passage about women. And uh, again, I'm, we won't go into it here. I explain it more in the book. But uh, the focus of that passage was the church's position to stand in the in the gap uh, for those who have been marginalized, mm -hmm. and 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 to confront those who are, who are doing the marginalizing, and uh, and Paul beautifully talks about that in in First Timothy chapter two. Good sustaining so a movement, standing up for the marginalized. Point number five stands firm in the faith. Yeah, th and this might. Uh, th make us think back to our earlier podcast in uh, chapter six in the book, Grounding a Movement. Uh, the, you know, Paul, again, it talks about what that movement taught, uh, it, how, what was the theology of that movement. And it is, it is it, in one and the same time, Christological, but Trinitarian. And its focus is always on the glory of God. And so stand firm. In, in that beautiful theology that Paul uh, brilliantly writes about in the letter to the Ephesians. I think there's a lot that's uh, common between this confronts false teaching and number seven, which we'll get to in a moment, which is keeps sound doctrine. Um, since uh, I, I'm just thinking of it, Michael, how would you differentiate confronts false teaching, stands firm in the faith, keep sound doctrine? How are those three different things that we also need to hold on to? Yeah, well, confront, it's easy to differentiate between confronting false teaching and holding the sound doctrine um, uh, and then standing firm in the faith. I mean, I mean, all of this is pointing to what it is that we believe 
and how that belief then is uh, is communicated in a in a community of those who are okay. working together. Uh, but it it also is uh, proven by the things that we do, um, and so it, it you know the doing part is the confronting of the false teaching. The believing part is holding on to the sound doctrine. The standing firm in the faith part is doing that in a community of of believers that uh, hold to the same things. Good. All right. Moving on then to point number six of sustaining a movement goes beyond the work of love, faith, service, and endurance. Yeah. So uh, again, Jesus here is is writing to uh, the, the next church, and he's talking about that uh, the, the, li- the life in the church is not just solely wrapped up in one or two things, but that we take we go the extra mile. And uh, it, that what it is that we do goes beyond these other things. Um, and, and again, I think Jesus is always pointing us back to God's mission. So it's more than just love and faith and service and endurance, but it's the proclamation of who he is to all people. So there is a call to say like the ongoing stewarding, the ongoing sustaining of the Christian movement actually does involve good works. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it involves the good works and involves our, our love for others uh, and involves service to others. And uh, it's going to endure uh, through doing those things. And that gets to the next point, uh, right. point six or seven. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Which then takes us into enduring then hardship. Right. Yeah. Yep. You know what? We know that it's going to happen. It happened in Ephesus. It happened in all the churches. Uh, when when uh, John is writing this letter, uh, the church is it could be right in the midst of the uh, uh, persecution, a severe persecution. And uh, we know from First Peter that that persecution is occurring. Uh, and we have references, uh, you know, to Paul's imprisonments and, and the trials that he faced. Mm-hmm. And so hardship does happen and uh, we need to endure it. Uh, and there's a promise that as we endure it, that, that Jesus is with us. Um, and, you know, and this is one of the beautiful things that I think is characteristic of a movement, at least as I look at movements around the world, is that so often you know, these movements are suffering through hardship, but you know what? Mm. They don't see it. They don't see it. And, and and their perspective is that, you know, this is a privilege that we have to proclaim God's word. I, I can remember being in South Asia and uh, sitting with a, a group of pastors in a small room and hearing their chit chatting going on. And, and of course I don't understand anything that they're saying, but <laughs> You know, they're laughing and carrying on. And I asked one of the guys, what are they talking about? And he said, well, this, this pastor's talking about the last time he was in prison. And this pastor's talking about when he was beaten. And this guy is talking about when he was kicked out of the town. And I'm sitting there thinking, holy cow. You know, this was so reminiscent of me being on uh, the playground as a, as a school uh, child and uh, talking about the bruises and the scars that we had from doing this or that, you know, well, I jumped a, a, off of a <laughs> ramp on a bike and crashed. And this is the scar I have from that. Or, you know, I jumped off of a building or what, you know, how we used to do and we compare our scars and we would laugh about it, you know, as if, as if we don't remember the pain uh, mm-hmm. from what we did, but the experience was something to be, shared and embellished and and told and uh and so i was thinking you know what these guys they, it's just the sheer joy of seeing more people worship god mm. that that pales to anything that they have suffered the imprisonments the beatings the being thrown out of uh towns i mean those things don't matter and here they can come together and the joy of sharing uh, in the service of the Lord and uh, and being together as brothers and sisters in Christ. I mean, it is just amazing to see and to hear uh, them share these stories as if they completely, for, they completely forget 
that this was a hardship or this was a pain um, because it's overshadowed by the joy of being on mission with God. I do find it so funny that in all things America, we, we, I mean, shoot, that's like almost like the key to Americanism is comfort. Like we strive for it. We seek it in every opportunity and every place. And so um, I preached and I've mentioned, I preached a few weeks ago in first Thessalonians and Paul talks about going to have persecution. Like you knew it was coming. I told you it was coming. It's now happening. So nobody should be surprised. And this was always going to happen. And so to hold in one hand, this for us in the West, this American way of life where comfort is king. And on the other hand, there is the gospel constantly telling us, telling people about Jesus is the most important thing. Discomfort, persecution is going to happen. So what are you going to hold on to, Titus? Are you going to hold on to comfort? Because if you are, then you're going to have to give up a lot of the gospel. Mm-hmm. You're going to not proclaim it. You're going to not put yourself out there. You're not going to be awkward because that will bring discomfort. Now, it might bring God's glory, but you know, you're know you going to have to choose. Mm-hmm. And man, we just don't like it. We don't like uh, it. You know, Andrew, I would even just take your your point even a step further, and I would I would suggest that in American Western culture, uh, we are actually training ourselves to avoid pain at all costs. No, we worship it, and exactly. And so it is. This is. It's no wonder the movement is falling apart. And actually, that's kind of one of the things that I'm, as I look at this list that 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 Michael has has put together and has seen here in Revelation. We point back to even all the other things of just the anatomy of movement, the pieces that make it. And I, I even when we talked about last week, like the pieces, the anatomy pieces are there. I, I think they're latent within all, every church that exists. Those pieces are there. They're either emphasized or de-emphasized at different levels. Right. When the sustaining aspect here, this is where the whole thing breaks apart. And it is no wonder that the church in the West is literally falling apart and crumbling and has been, and the trend lines are undeniable. Um, Because there is a failure to listen to the Holy Spirit, there is a failure to confront false teaching. There is a failure to proclaim God's glory. There is a failure to stand up for the marginalized. There's a failure to stand firm in the faith, uh, which also I think seems like it also goes well, even with enduring hardship and persecution. Um, There is a, um, and I'm, Persecution, I, I think, is something else. I mean, we just we we, right. we don't even know what persecution is. <laughs> well, we know what hardship is, um, but we, that is something that we avoid. It, we fail to go beyond the work of love, faith, service, and endurance, um, and keeping sound doctrine. And this is one of those key things: is that we just don't want to. We our culture is like you said: we worship comfort, and therefore we want to. We're, we've trained ourselves to to avoid hardship at all costs, and it is killing, destroying the church. Mm. Yeah, and I, I want to just, I think, reiterate, and I, I hope that we've been communicating this throughout um, our podcast, is that the church is not going to die. It, it's no. not going to happen. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. Jesus promised that he was going to build it. He's Amen. Head of Amen. It. He's the sustainer of it. Now, there so might- it doesn't matter how many people keep telling us it's going to die if we just don't do this one thing in our generation. It's all going to hell in a handbasket. Are they lying? Right. Is it fear mongering? I, I think it, to some extent that it, it it might be in a and I I mean yeah I don't want to go there but um, good choice yeah <laughs> but you know Jesus has promised it's gonna it's gonna. Uh, sustained. But the thing is, is that there might be local bodies of believers that will disappear. And, uh, and what I think we're trying to draw our attention to is that Jesus clearly gives instructions to these beautiful saints that are living in very difficult times. And yet the gospel continues to be proclaimed. And he's saying, you know, keep it up. Don't lose your focus. Keep your eye on me, and uh, and he's going to be with us to the end. And there's the then the beautiful picture at the end of the book of Revelation of being in the presence of God on the streets of gold in the new earth with a new heaven, and uh, where he mm-hmm. wipes away all the tears 
of 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 our past and and uh yeah well and michael i think even to your point what we're really trying to get here is understanding is not rather paint paint the doom and gloom picture of the church but rather to say we are people meant for a mission who are Mm. meant for a movement and we recognize that the movement has stalled out and is in decline and therefore let's reignite the mission and understand the heart of that mission so that the movement can be reignited with with a fresh wind of fire if you will um and so i think when we look at these pieces of sustaining the movement uh, we need to look long and hard at those elements and going, why has the movement not sustained? And let us then evaluate ourselves in light of those and say, here's where we need to be going again. Here's, this is, these are the pieces to, the, to that pie, I think. Can I jump in and just say, so what if, I think uh, if anybody has listened to previous podcasts, then you're going to say, Andrew, this is retread. Forgive me. But what if people are listening to everything that you both just said, Matt, Michael, and they are saying, "Mm, yes, we are not sustaining this movement because we are doing the wrong things on Sunday morning. So what we need to do is just slightly change what we're doing on Sunday morning. And then, and then it's fine. Right. That's what I, that's, we're not doing enough to proclaim God's glory on Sunday morning. So I just need to tweak this just a little bit and then we can see a movement. What would you both say to that, what I would call fallacy? Matt? <laughs> <laughs> You're pitching over to me. Well, I mean, you know, I think that's the, um, that is in fact the, the, the issue that we are always combating is that these are not mere tweaks. These are paradigm shifts. Oh. And the paradigm is requires um, some significant reconstruction, and so we're not just talking about here on on ephesiology. We're not just saying here's your next tweak, here's your next model adjustment, here's the next thing you need to try or do on a Sunday um, to make it all finally work. Um, we're we're actually trying to address the things that we're holding on to wrongly. We're trying to adjust and, and, hold, and look at the things that we've been propagating and doing and suggest, let us return back to the first century. Let us learn again from that early, the first century church, the movement in Ephesus and see how God's glory was shown and portrayed and just was, ra- I mean, just radically changing the culture of its time and see what elements and pieces were a part of that and then look at it and go, what does it take for us to live in that way? Mm-hmm. And I, we have to have that self-evaluation and go, where have we gotten this wrong? And, and it has to be an honest self-evaluation. I mean, there's yeah. there, um, and I've had these conversations and you guys have as well, that, that uh, th- there is always this kind of dichotomy between what we, we perceive as being the reality in our particular context or church and then what really is the reality in that in that church or context and uh th- what what we need to do is in an honest evaluation is to bring those two things together that yes our aspiration might be that we want to be this but the reality is we're really this but how do we move that reality toward our aspiration and and really become uh, a movement of god and what that Matt, as you said what that means is that there might be a paradigm shift that's in order. And, uh, and when we come out uh, on the other side, it might not look like what we see it today. It might look completely different. And that doesn't mean that, you know, that we want to come in and blow up the legacy church. I think that there can be something, a revival within the legacy church that could just be fantastic and could propel this movement with a force like we've never seen before. If we get our aspirations lined up with reality, well, no. <laughs> yeah, I good thing I kept that word going. Yes, you did. You didn't. You didn't pause. <laughs> if we get our 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 uh, aspirations in line with reality, and then get going, and take the risk that it's going to take to, uh, to be on God's mission. 
This is one of the things that I'm most excited about as we have continued to harp on this is that we as a physiology through the book and through all that we've done in this podcast, it isn't just saying we have the best model and uh, whatever model you're doing sucks. That's why it's not working because you have the wrong model. Just adopt our model and then all things will be made well. This is not cookie cutter. And frankly, I love that the fact that the very first thing that we talked about today was obeying the Holy Spirit, because obeying the Holy Spirit might look like, I'm not saying, sorry, this is going to come out weird. It's going to look differently contextually. When we listen to the Holy Spirit, what Matt is doing where he is, is going to necessarily look different than where I am, because Houston is not Chicago, and Chicago is not Houston, and Lake Zurich is not Chicago. Chicago is not Lake Zurich. I mean, there is something different. And by listening to the Holy Spirit, it is going to come out differently in the living out. And so we're not saying just destroy all Sunday mornings, like blow up the legacy church. They've been doing it wrong. Right. It's start listening to the Holy Spirit. Yeah. What are the aspirations that we want to do to faithfully obey and see his word proclaimed? Mm. Yeah. yeah. Amen. 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 Yeah. Amen. Sustaining a movement, obeys the Holy Spirit, confronts false teaching, proclaims God's glory, stands up for the marginalized, stands firm in the faith, goes beyond the work of love, faith, service, and endurance, endures hardship, and finally keeps sound doctrine. Uh, we didn't touch. We talked. We touched on that a little bit. But Michael, do you have any final thoughts on on keeps sound doctrine? I mean, that's a thread throughout uh, keeping right. sound doctrine, and and uh, so, uh, again, it, what we're seeing is that we're struggling in this area, and particularly in the United States, and and perhaps around the world. I'm I'm concerned about that. Um, as as we tend to still have the, the influence. Yeah, I was thinking about this the other day. Uh, but I can't. I think it's. I can't remember how the the traditional phrase goes. But um, it, as I think about the United States, if the church in America sneezes, the churches around the world catch a cold. And so, whatever it is that happens here, it it, it eventually influences mm. things overseas. And I can remember, you know, back in the '90s when. At Willow Creek and Saddleback and these larger churches became very popular. And so that, that influenced uh, a whole generation, if not more, absolutely uh, churches and church planters uh, around the world. And um, if the church in America sneezes, the churches around the world are going to catch a cold. And so we have to be very careful in, in what we're doing in the United States. And you- uh, we have got to get this boat, uh, aligned properly and uh, and on the right path, because we're having an influence, and we might not realize the impact of that influence until it's too late. Do you feel like that? Uh, perhaps it's possible that that is uh, that that trend is beginning to shift. Uh, there's been a lot of influence of uh, churches in Latin America that have now. Um, in Central America, I feel like has, has kind of begun to influence. And I know there's been a lot of reverse church planting that's been taking place um, that, you know, it's even in our, even in our context, you feel like that maybe might be starting to, to shift or is it just kind of it repeating itself or something? We have yeah, that loop. yeah, that's a great question. And uh, I think more study has to be done on what's going on in terms, in terms of re- reverse mission, because it's certainly happening. I mean, uh, statistically speaking, the United States receives more missionaries than it sends. And, um, it, but typically those missionaries are going to ethnic populations in the United States and not necessarily to uh, the majority population. Um, it, the question is, have, has our influence marked those movements as they now are going out around the world? Brazil, for example, since, uh, it probably uh, sends a significant number of missionaries around the world and and uh it, but has the influence from american evangelicalism affected the church in brazil to such an extent that they're just simply propagating uh what they learned from the church in america and that's a concern that i have and we should have um, but we need to study it and see what exactly is is happening. Mm. You know, there are some countries that are that are uh, sending missionaries, and they're doing what we did uh, in 
that they are planting churches that look like their churches from their country. And, um, and I'm, I'm not so certain that that's the way. I, I think what Andrew pointed out is that the church needs to look unique. I mean, the situations in different parts of the world yeah. are unique to those parts of the world. And the church is God's instrument to be able to uniquely address those things in ways that that will honor and respect the culture of the people, not become relativistic, but will honor and respect those cultures and genuinely be expressions of, uh, uh, of who they are as they're worshiping before the throne of God. With sound doctrine. With sound with, doctrine. You know, with sound doctrine, uh, solid Christology. I mean, those things don't change. I mean, this again, this is, this is exactly what this point is. Yeah. Um, you will keep it. Uh, the form, form changes, function doesn't. Absolutely. Absolutely. A- absolutely. Yeah. And I think, I, I mean, as I think about the future and, and where we need to go from here, I think we need to give very serious attention to a robust Christology as well as serious attention to a robust ecclesiology. I think those two areas uh, as we move forward uh, are, are critical. Mm. Mm. Um, book publishers, that is actually going to be book number two and book number three coming out from Ephesiology. <laughs> so if you want to start putting your bids in now, we'll start right. writing. Yeah. yeah, one by Matt and one by Andrew. Well placed, well placed. Well, I think that'll do it for us here on the Ephesiology Podcast. Thanks for joining us today as we dissected and looked at uh, what it takes to sustain a movement. And of course, we encourage you uh, as our listeners and just those who are doing theology in community with us to join us on the website at ephesiology.com and of course on our Facebook page by just searching for Ephesiology. Uh, You can dialogue with us there, articles that we share, and um, and we love hearing from you and just comments and questions that you might have even in regards to the topics in which we're talking about. And do not forget, get on, get a, a go ahead and pre-order the book now today. Uh, you can do that at physiology.com uh, and also um, on Amazon, of course, and uh, get your your cop uh, as soon as it is released. So we look forward to hearing about just feedback and be sure to leave uh, favorable reviews as well too. We'd love to hear from those who are listening and reading along and uh, sharing it with their their team members, their pastors, um, and uh, other Christian leaders and. Uh, who are really interested in thinking about movements uh, in, in the church and not just in the West, but even globally as well. So for Michael, Andrew, and myself, we thank you for listening and we'll catch you next time on the Physiology Podcast.